Hello, good morning, afternoon, evening, night, <laughs> everyone. Um, my name is Mariana Valente. I am one of the directors of Internet Lab. That's a think tank based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, and I want to start by saying that we are extremely thankful for the opportunity to be having this discussion here. I'd like to thank our panelists for accepting and having been engaged. And really, thanks a lot to the audience that's watching. We realize these are really challenging times. So we're especially grateful and we'll try to make the most of this opportunity. We had thought of this panel before the COVID crisis. Uh, we at Internet Lab have been working in partnership with many of the panelists and engaging in a conversation around this emerging framework of social protection or public policies and datafication, data justice, as well as the intersections of those concerns with discussions around privacy and gender. And we also thought of this as an opportunity to gather experts doing research in these topics in Latin America to map regional trends and connect with other stakeholders who might be working on the same. Well, it must be said that throughout the region since the 90s, the 90s we can feel a, a certain pattern of social protection uh, that has spread. The model of conditional cash transfer for families or individuals in pro poverty or extreme poverty. And these programs throughout the region, they generate an enormous amount of data to ensure adequate targeting and verify the beneficiary's compliance with the conditionalities associated with the benefits. Um, and in the past few years, this process accelerated due to both increased technology, technological capabilities, but also with economic trends, especially austerity policies. So data and technology is deployed in that process as means for the pursuit of expenditure savings, in many cases associated with narratives around fraud. And the questions are, what are the consequences for individuals and for societies? And which frameworks suit us in this, in this analysis? We're thinking here of impacts on the exercise of human rights, such as privacy, uh, informational self-determination, uh, reproductive rights. Um, and while this has been important for some time already, we have to say that this subject gained even more momentum with the, the crisis that we're going through, both because of new social protection schemes being developed throughout the region or existing ones being deployed to tackle the impoverishment of population in a region because of the pandemic, uh, but also because data is being deployed in new ways. There are new narratives in place around the use of data for public policies in this moment. Uh, and how does that change the overall situation? So I hope that some of the participants can also um, bring this discussion forward. For that discussion, we have five panelists whom I also asked to briefly introduce themselves and present their ideas for seven minutes, and then we will open the floor for questions from the audience. And very briefly about each one of them, Laura Lazaro Cabrera is legal officer at Privacy International and is based in London. Natalie is the coordinator for privacy and surveillance at Internet Lab Brazil. Jamila Venturini is the regional coordinator at Derechos Digitales. Juan Diego Castaneda is a lawyer and researcher from Fundación Carisma Colombia. Christian Van Vien, uh, director of the Digital Welfare State and Human Rights Project based at the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at NYU Law. So I'll start by giving the floor to Laura. So Laura, Privacy International develops and supports research around the world on privacy and welfare, including the trends of the data, datafication of social programs. What trends or what problems, what impacts do you observe? Are there any specificities relevant to the global south? And lastly, what function does technology perform in welfare systems? Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Mariana. And as has already been foreshadowed very helpfully by Mariana, Privacy International works in the intersection between privacy, surveillance, and welfare benefit systems. And it is really in this context that we've observed that at a global level, we're seeing a return to austerity. And alongside that, we're seeing the growing popularity of a narrative 
which prioritizes efficiency as a driving principle in government spending, including welfare benefits. The issue with this concept of efficiency is that on a conceptual level, it naturally leans towards easy categorization of welfare benefits recipients between the deserving to the non-deserving and continuous monitoring of these categories. On the technical level, furthermore, the principle of efficiency relies on data intensive sorting algorithms to optimize welfare benefits delivery. As a result, we're witnessing welfare benefit systems moving towards a new normal, which relies on increased automation and datafication. And there are a series of problems with this phenomenon, uh, but I believe that they can broadly be classified into two categories. The first one being a privacy or surveillance problem, and the second one being an access to justice or due process problem. Within the first, we're seeing a vast amount of personal data that is being collected in order to both determine and maintain eligibility to benefits, which oftentimes can go beyond what is strictly necessary to know whether a person should be entitled to a benefit. And this can involve data matching and data sharing processes, which are unknown to the applicant. In terms of access to justice, a problem is the lack of transparency in what has become an increasingly dehumanized decision-making process, which prevents people from challenging the outcomes effectively. And what, what this means generally is that as a benefits claimant, you can hardly ever win. If you obtain the benefit, then you're committing or agreeing to being closely monitored by the government, which wants to make sure you're not the fraud in the system. And this really is the approach predominantly taken by countries in the global north. And then on the other side, if you don't obtain the benefit, the appeal process is likely to be complex at best and obscure at worst. Either way, you need significant time and resources to challenge the outcome. But what we've observed is that the harms can be even more pervasive. And in the long term, and in the absence of suitable privacy safeguards, the vast personal information collected by the government in the benefits application and delivery process may be used for other purposes that you could have never imagined. And this is why the title of this event is particularly appropriate because you are really caught in the net. As for what we've observed in the Global South, uh, we can say that the issue currently is not so much automation and fraud detection, but automation and identification at the stage of determining eligibility for benefits. And that really takes two principal forms. The first one would be the integration of ID systems with welfare benefit systems, which is what happens in India and Kenya, for example. But another issue that we're seeing and that has growing importance is integration of multiple government databases for points-based systems for welfare benefits. And I believe that this is the case in Colombia and also Chile. And it is likely to be a model that many countries will follow as it makes it easier for governments to determine eligibility on their own terms and without having applicants know exactly what information is being had about them. So you could say that in the global south, we're probably at an early stage to the extent that automation and adaptification processes are focused on eligibility. But I want to emphasize that that doesn't mean that it is any less concerning. It means that there is significant data sharing between government agencies with little transparency to the user and potential long-term consequences, which are very obscure as of now. Laura, thank you so much. I think your comments, especially the last ones, they connect a lot with what our next panelists are going to bring uh, as results from their research. So I'll give the floor to Juan Diego, asking him to tell us about the Colombian experience with CISBEN system of possible beneficiaries of social programs, and perhaps also the most recent Ingreso Solidario, Solidarity Income, and the findings of the Carisma Foundation. Please, Juan Diego. Thank you, Mariana. Well, um, yeah, I'm Juan Diego Castaneda. I am a lawyer and I work in Carisma as a researcher and project coordinator. And, um, well, we we've been researching this topic of uh, social benefits uh, for the last year. Uh, mainly because of an interest that I think I think we, we can share in the global south, which is we have these projects that they say we're going to have artificial intelligence and these very complex systems and uh, techniques. But then you have uh, that in the end they don't work like that. They they are not they are just uh, proposals or they are just drafts or designs. 
So we decided to take a look at one very well-established program, a uh, social program that is called CISBEN, as Mariana said. It's called System of Possible Beneficiaries of Social Programs. And um, it, it, it's working since 1994. And we've seen, um, to, to open what uh, Laura was saying about uh, the general characteristics of social programs right now, uh, they are being heavily identified. So since then, what basically since then does is to survey people. The way they gather data, data is that they go to people's uh, houses and they go to, they, uh, through surveys, they ask people how they live. They assess the conditions of living, like the, the kind of roof they have, kind of the condition, the materials of the floor, uh, how many um, electrical devices, uh, electronics they have uh, in their houses. And based on that data and other data that we don't know since the beginning of times, since 1994, um, they assess, uh, they, they produce a score that goes from zero to 100. Zero meaning uh, worst uh, livelihood conditions and 100 the best conditions. And um, it determines for other uh, social uh, institutions, for other uh, government institutions, the accessibility uh, that people has to uh, social programs. So, for example, uh, this, edu this particular education program uh, needs people scoring from 32 to 45 uh, points of CISBEC. So that's more or less how it works. And uh, it's same it, right now, gathers data from 30 million people and the, the proposals uh, aim to mm, nearly 90% uh, of the population. So you have these 90% of being 40 million, 40 million people here in Colombia. So it's very extensive and it has been changed uh, recently. So the first change, uh, it, it deals with the idea of data change that that's spot on with what Laura was saying. It's uh, a heavily emphasis on the government uh, change of data. So they know who are the liars, who are the people that are lying to the system. And, uh, and that's kind of the, the rough translation of the word they've been using, the people that wants to uh, make traps for the system of appear as poor as they, they are, so they can access to social benefits. But also, the possibility that these data could be used in the private sector to develop products. So um, that, that, that's part of this data change. And also one other big change that I think would be interesting for many people, uh, which is the uh, change from assessing uh, conditions of living to the prediction of income. So the problem they had is that we have many poor people as per other measures and a monetary, monetary uh, poverty, uh, um, I forgot the other one, so they, they, by those measures, they have too many, uh, too, they, they don't have as many poor people as his Ben indicates. So it, it produces the need to change the way they measure poverty. And I think that's very interesting because it, it talks about how technologies, and in this case, it could be easily uh, a database crossing makes, makes poor people, that, like the, the categories made by the crossing of data. It's not like it's found there because that's, part of what is uh, the use of technology is kind of uh, neglecting that, that they could make the people, make the kind of poor people through databases. So um, this is uh, this is or less what we had on CISBEN, what we've been having on CISBEN. We have a lot of troubles. For example, one of them, like I think very, very easy is that why these systems, they, they focus their, their efforts on people, on this idea of the liar, the people that lie to the system, to the surveyors, and uh, instead of going through the chain of uh, resource distribution and allocation in the government. So they focus all these, by the way, technological power in the people inside, uh, towards it's addressed to the people that is going to be presented to the government. They should present through data their honesty, in the, uh, like uh, even it's like a model judgment um, through data. So they have to present uh, proof that they are that they are uh, uh, saying the truth, that they are not lying to the system. This proof presentation, this evidence presentation, is not like a, uh, it's not like a uh, procedure that they have to do, but it's more uh, they. I think that is being done through the database and crossing. And um, we also had in these times of crisis, we had uh, the another program called Solidarity Income or Ingreso Solidario. And basically, it goes, um, it veers, it moves away from CISBEN because they don't use the same uh, survey data, but they want to address people that are outside the CISBEN, so people that they are not even touching. 
by CISBEN, by the government numbers. We have like 2 million people being, being addressed now by this program. And it's basically the result of a, a heavily crossing of uh, private and uh, public databases. So people that doesn't have uh, bank accounts, they don't have, um, they, don't, they haven't been beneficiaries of any social program. And a lot of uh, information coming from uh, banks, coming from uh, other uh, government institutions. So in the end, what we have is the big database. It's called the master database, uh, master information database, in which they basically, they address, they, they try to find people that are outliers. So it could be because we have been uh, having discussions inside Colombia about the, the convenience of this other program. And basically one thing that it could be doing is being broader and it's been and the algorithm is easy is it has been better explained that has been because it's been's algorithm is secret we made a petition and it's been called secret so uh, it has been different and i think the crisis had, had been offered different possibilities to think about poverty uh aids poverty subsidies so i guess i'll i'll, I'll leave it here but yeah i think in the comments we can have more discussion thank you very much Juan. i think many questions arise from your presentation and also uh, many comparisons with other programs from the region. So I'll directly give the floor to Natalie, who will speak uh, about the results of the project developed by Internet Lab on Privacy and Gender in the Bolsa Familia program uh, to ask her what that research tells us and how does Brazil and the Bolsa Familia program specifically relate to this trend of datafication uh, in the region and impact on rights. Hi, Mariana. Hi, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, and evening to all. Uh, as Mari said, I'm Natalie. I'm the head of research on privacy and surveillance at Internet Lab, a think tank on law and technology based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it's important to mention that this project that I'm going to talk about right now is a joint effort uh, of two areas in Internet Lab. One of them is inequalities and identities, coordinated by Natalia Neres and the other areas, privacy and surveillance. And here I am to talk a little bit about that. So I guess the first first thing that I have to say about Bolsa Familia, um, the Bolsa Familia program, we try to analyze the data flows, the regulations, also the complaints against the beneficiaries, which are predominantly women. We are talking about almost 90% of the beneficiaries being women in order to understand how being a beneficiary impacts their right to privacy, right? And then we had to take a deep look into the program itself and realize that the data collection is uh, an integral part of the program. We are talking about a targeted and conditional cash transfer. So an, a large amount of data is collected in order to select beneficiaries, in order to make uh, it's certain that the right people, according to the criteria of force established by the government, are receiving the benefits in order to stop the benefits for the people who are not eligible anymore, in order to receive complaints, in order to make the data updated. So we are talking about an a information chain who is an integral part of the program since its beginning. So as a tax conditional cash transfer program, the collection and processing of data are cons constitutive of the design of PBF. Since its, its implementation, the CAD Unico, Cadastro Unico, which is a form of a single registry with a lot of information on identification and also a lot of information on elements which characterize the situations of deprivation of the people who might or might not be eligible for a lot of programs, including Bolsa Familia, especially Bolsa Familia, Cadunc has been deployed as this data instrument in order to identify beneficiaries, in order to formulate public policies, in order to uh, offer, uh, in the oper operationalization of, the, of a lot of pu public policies. So the first thing I have to say is that the effort to identify and characterize deprivations in a country which has a, a history of social protection with very exclusionary and very in, and with contributory uh, traits, 
it was a leap forward to look to the low income population and try to assess what are well, what are their needs, what kind of deprivations they are experiencing. But we also found that found out that this certification pro, uh, process was not accompanied by data rights or data justice kind of uh, measures. So in our analysis, we identified problems, for example, in the way beneficiaries data were being collected, were being processed. The collection was not uh, kind of it was not minimal. So we are talking about a, a huge amount of data, not uh, not all of them with their necessity motivated and justified. We are talking about little transparency in relation to the processing. We are also talking about the increasingly facilitated sharing of those databases. We are also talking about a late development of security and access policies. And also, I guess, one other thing that we found out is that there are a lot of sharing methods which undermine protections against, for example, unjustified access. So in a rights-based dimension, in addition to the alienation result resulting from the lack of transparency, the lack of knowledge about the specific processings uh, of those data, we also saw an unequal exposure of the beneficiaries. And this, for example, because there is an intense routine of inspection, which has a lot to do with what Juan Diego and also Laura talked about. So an intense routine of inspection, which includes not only the Ministry of Citizenship, not only the control agencies, but also other citizens who have access, for example, every month to data of every single beneficiary of PBF, of PBF, of the Bolsa Familia program. So as a transparency measure, the government in Brazil uh, publicizes every month the list of people who receive PBF. And we, we saw that because we had access, we could, we could read the complaints made about the beneficiaries, which are not so many when we, when we see the, 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 the huge uh, number of beneficiaries and who do not lead to the exclusion of, in, in, of the program. But we do identify that there are a lot of personal information given by the people presenting their complaints against beneficiaries, for, for example. And that was also a, a, an interesting finding. So this exposure, this unequal exposure of the, 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 bene, the beneficiary, the Bolsa Familia program is, is our main finding. And we found, we saw that not only in those transparency measures, in that routine of, of inspection, or in, in that growing sharing of public databases, but also in this kind of uh, surveillance culture who could be associated to the need to verify that everybody who receives Bolsa Familia are eligible, are not lying about their income are not lying uh, about other uh, elements and are complying with the conditions which uh, benefit uh, Bolsa Familia establishes. So I guess that's our conclusions, our, our conclusions on, on that topic. And I guess one last comment I have to say is that this exposure initially was aligned with the need to gain legitimacy to the program, which was fiercely resisted in Brazil. But then um, we now perceive uh, an alignment with this austerity discourse, with the austerity measures. And nowadays, the inspection routines serve to the, or, or intend to serve to the reduction of the program. Thank you, Mari. Thank you all. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm also collaborating with that research, so it's really good to see it summarized. Uh, I hope we can uh, gather some discussion around it. And I think it also connects, it connects a lot with what Juan Diego said, but also con it connects with the work that Jamila from Derechos Digitales is doing. So Jamila, I know that Derechos has also produced research on the exclusionary discriminatory effects of some of these technologies absorbed in social protection. So can you share that with us, with the audience, taking advantage of your organization's regional presence also 
what common elements do you see in the region? Thank you in advance, Jamila. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to share some of these, uh, these findings, these thoughts here with you. Uh, at Derechos Digitales, we have uh, observed a growing trend in the region towards the implementation of surveillance technologies and automated systems that are based in intensive data collection and processing in order to control access to public services and social rights or to legitimate state interventions in context of extreme vulnerabilities. Um, uh, the first case I, I can share with you, it's related to a research that we are also developing in partnership with Privacy International. It is led by Mariana Diaz, which is a member of our research and policy team. And it, it has to do with the use of biometric technologies to control access to food and medicine in Venezuela. And um, reports already point out to discrimination against migrants and transgender people in the context of this uh, this uh, program, for instance, and that are depriving them from the possibility to access uh, the limited first need products in a country that is suffering from a long-standing political and humanitarian monetary crisis. Uh, at the same time, we know that uh, finger, fingerprints that are collected through these biometric systems and they are used for validation which includes also electoral information. And it's operated both by state authorities and uh, supermarkets or drugstores operators or empl employees in the absence of a, a unified data protection framework, uh, which opens a wide space for, for abuse in our, in our perspective and analysis. The digitization of certain procedures for applying to social welfare programs, as uh, both uh, Juan Diego and Natalie mentioned before, are becoming more and more common in the region, and there are creating new barriers for access and imply sex excessive processing of data. Uh, access barriers include digital divides in all levels, which includes digital literacy, access to internet connectivity, access to devices, uh, as well as other forms of structural inequalities. But besides the enormous potential for abuse, and data misuse, especially in some of these uh, politically polarized environments that we are talking about. Um, we also observe that they facilitate discriminatory pra pra practices that go way beyond requirements and that are opaque to the public and to people that are affected. What I'm saying that criteria used, uh, as you were mentioning uh, before me, criteria used for declaring someone's eligibility in these types of programs uh, might become opaque to these people and might include elements and criteria that is not included or not predicted in law explicitly. Uh, the Brazilian case, which you described uh, right now, but also the Brazilian approach to the delivery of emergency welfare uh, assistance during the COVID-19 pandemic is an example of this type of uh, situation. And also the, the plans, the explicit plans by the Bolivian government to integrate uh, health databases with social protection, police and armed forces databases also point out in that direction during the, the current pandemic, right? In other countries, what we have seen is that invasive surveillance technologies or data processing practices target particularly vulnerable populations, making them more visible and more vulnerable to state interventions. Uh, in Chile, for instance, we, we analyze the predictive system, which processes an amount of data from different public databases, and it's being used to rate children and adolescents according to the probability that they will suffer abuses or maltreatment. Uh, of course, poverty is one of the risk factors considered that, considered in that. Uh, and this involves integrating and sharing sensitive personal data from minors with third parties without any legal guarantees that the information generated will not that could uh, result in new forms of discrimination against these children and families. A similar example uh, can be found in the northern, northern province of Argentina, where an automated system uh, is being implemented in partnership with Microsoft. Uh, to predict teenage pregnancy and uh, school dropout. 
at least five other Latin American uh, countries are also implementing these systems, which, it's, which is based in uh, intensive collection and processing of data from these, these particular groups. And finally, I guess that um, for this initial presentation at least, and then we can continue and get deep in each of these cases. But I wanted to give an overview of the types of situation that we have been seeing in the, in the region. Uh, besides creating new avenues, avenues for discrimination and abuse, uh, as I mentioned in a context which is politically unstable in several of the countries, uh, the implementation of this type of surveillance technologies, which include biometric technologies, data collection and processing uh, for, to control the use of social benefits, implies a differential treatment on how people exercise their fundamental rights, including privacy. So it implies another layer of discrimination against some populations that cannot, uh, cannot uh, exercise their fundamental right to privacy in that case, because they are being forced to adopt to these uh, uh, surveillance uh, techniques in order to, um, in order to access uh, social and economic rights. So in that sense, I can mention the use of facial recognition technologies in public transportation, which is happening in several Brazilian cities or to control access to public spaces by minors, elderly, disabled populations in Ecuador, also through facial recognition uh, technologies. Um, and we believe that this type of control is usually excessive and unnecessary. Uh, as some have mentioned before, they respond to some external, and I, I would say external in the sense of international interests for limiting access to social welfare at the same time that it opens space for private actors which profit from data collection and processing and find in our uh, global south countries a perfect space to, to grow their businesses. So this is kind of the, the, the large scenario. I guess there is a lot uh, that we can discuss from that, but um, that's what we have been observing in the region with a lot of concern. Jamila. Thanks a lot, really. That was really helpful, like having a general overview of different things that are happening in different countries. And with that, I'll give the floor to Christian, uh, who also speaks from a broad perspective on the impacts of digitization on human rights, especially social rights, uh, risks, and the role that organizations can play in this context. But that I understand, who I understand that's also who's also working on uh, these issues in other regions, especially uh, in the African continent. Uh, so, Christian, uh, if you could share those views and experiences with us, have another seven minutes. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Mariana, and thanks to you and, uh, and your colleagues for organizing this uh, this great event. And um, um, just to mention at the outset that I'm coming at this from the perspective of the work I'm currently doing in the African region, as you said, and um, on Thursday, I will also sort of address some of those um, issues in a panel we're organizing with the Open Society Justice Initiative on strategic litigation and digital ID, which is related uh, to the to discussion we're having today, which might be interesting to some in the audience, uh, I think. Um, I think just at the outset, one thing that's relevant to mention is that um, before I took on my current role, as a director of a project on the digital welfare state and, uh, and human rights at NYU. Uh, I worked for many years for the United Nations uh, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And uh, social protection was one of the themes that we consistently addressed over the six years of, uh, of that mandate, uh, both the role that it played as an alleviator of um, uh, systemic poverty, uh, but also uh, its importance for the realization of social rights. Uh, and so we did that in country visits to Chile, for instance, or to Saudi Arabia, but also to the United Kingdom. And uh, we also did that in a number of thematic reports, for instance, on uh, the World Bank uh, and on the IMF and social protection, uh, which I think is sort of a relevant background for the discussion we're having today. And uh, the thing to emphasize then at the outset is that Sort of, if you think away digitalization, digitization, 
uh, there are many human rights issues attached uh, to what's happening in social protection systems already. And, and that's a relevant, very relevant background, I think. Uh, so in, in those thematic reports that we worked on before, uh, we described how there's basically a split uh, in the international uh, uh, area, so between international organizations, between a social safety net approach on the one end uh, and a human rights or social citizenship approach to social protection on the other with that former social safety net approach being uh, championed by the World Bank and also the IMF uh, more recently, which is all about sort of short-term help for the, for the poorest, uh, temporary safety net in times of crisis and shock. While the other uh, social citizenship or human rights approach, uh, for instance, championed by uh, ILO, by UNICEF, um, is starting from the, from the idea that social protection is a human right um, and uh, that there should be something such as universal coverage, uh, that there should be access to a range of social uh, policy beyond mere cash transfers. Uh, and, and that's a very important difference. And that's about more than sort of simply semantics, uh, because the World Bank has very often um, um, turned targeting uh, of, of cash transfers and social protection measures into uh, what some have called uh, a bit of a fetish. Um, um, this is this sort of obsession with making sure that cash transfers, for instance, only go to the poorest of the poor, based on the idea that government should be sort of nimble and small, um, that there shouldn't be leakage to the non-poor, uh, that there needs to be efficiency in social protection. And uh, what you get from those um, uh, policy principles is exclusion. Exclusion is more or less baked in to a lot of social protection systems in the global south because of, in part, that obsession with uh, with targeting. Um, and you see that in in, in cash transfer systems, uh, especially, as was said, these are relatively recent phenomenon. I think no one was talking about uh, cash transfers before the mid 90s and what's also very important to highlight there is that cash transfer systems are very much sort of uh, local innovations uh, in Brazil in Mexico that's where this started only later was it sort of adopted and embraced by the international uh, development community uh, and seen as one of their uh, uh, policy priorities and then so sort of where digitalization uh, digitization in cash transfer uh, systems uh, uh, comes in is in a number of ways. And this is highly dependent on what country you're talking about because it depends in part of the sort of IT infrastructure that's there, other sort of historical uh, factors. But what I've seen so far is that there are a range of functions uh, that are being um, digitized in, in various ways. So we've already talked about registration, the phenomenon of social or single registries, um, uh, defining, um, um, verifying, authenticating someone's identity. Uh, so this whole uh, move towards digital uh, ID systems. Uh, payments are increasingly um, uh, being digitized. Um, whether you meet the conditions attached to your cash transfer, um, and I could go, I could go on. And um, what's good to note then is that what is happening here, these, these, these digital innovations are taking place in the administrative and delivery side of social protection, which is often perceived, I think, by many uh, in the development field as a highly technical area, not one that's very sort of directly uh, linked to uh, policy. And I think that's, that's a mistake because a lot of these sort of broader discussions about universality versus targeting, et cetera, you see those come back in those more technical uh, debates about digitalization. And so since it's such a highly political debate about who gets what and uh, who doesn't, um, uh, that's one of the reasons why civil societies will get much more involved in those, uh, in those debates. And it's great to hear uh, that the organizations represented here are, are doing that work uh, uh, right now. Um, so in terms of um, the work that I've done, so last year we did a report uh, with the Special Rapporteur to uh, the UN General Assembly, more globally speaking, on digital welfare states in the global north and in the global south. We're now doing a follow-up report with the current, uh, so the new Special Rapporteur in Extreme Poverty and the previous one, so they're doing a joint report looking at cash transfer systems, digitalization and human rights in uh, in Africa. And um, 
there are a number of, we've done some consultations recently uh, with civil society organizations from Africa, with international organizations. Uh, and there's some concerns already sort of emerging that I think overlap uh, with the concerns that are just voiced from the Latin America region. Um, just to name a few, I think one is that um, digitalization does not necessarily resolve exclusion of people from cash transfer systems. So there's this idea that inclusion is helped by digitalization. Uh, but if you have a digital registry instead of a paper registry, for instance, of the poor, that does not necessarily mean that everyone is in there. A government can still decide that region where that particular uh, population lives that we don't like uh, or that doesn't vote for us. Uh, we're not going to register anyone there. doesn't matter if, if you have a digital or non-digital registry for that particular form of exclusion. What you do see then is that when uh, digitalization kicks in, as was just said, I think by Jamila, is then digital divide issues become, um, become prevalent. So you get on top of pre-existing exclusion, you get digital exclusion. Who has an internet connection that functions? Um, who knows how to deal uh, with banking online? Uh, on a mobile a mobile phone, for instance. And, um, and obviously, uh, sort of that digital divide is not just who's in and who's out, but also women are less likely uh, to be digitally included. Uh, certain parts of the population are less likely to be included. So it overlaps with a lot of um, uh, other, other factors. That's one part of exclusion. I think integration, as was mentioned, is another. So for instance, what you see with digital ID systems, these become de facto portals to accessing a range of uh, social uh, rights from cash transfers to healthcare to education and so on. And the fact that there's now sort of integration of different uh, data sets means that if you're excluded from that portal, you're basically excluded from everything in one go. So integration is not just a risk from a privacy perspective, it's also a risk from an exclusion uh, perspective. Um, you see a few other um, related concerns as well. One was already mentioned, sort of this um, uh, targeting of who's trying to defraud the system, uh, but also the targeting of who gets assistance and who doesn't get assistance. And in all those targeted me mechanisms, whether it's a proxy means test or a fraud assessment uh, tool, uh, discrimination is lurking in the, in the background because it's all about discriminating a uh, targeting uh, mechanism. It's all about sort of who's suspect and who isn't. And the risks are very high that that overlaps with sort of prohibited forms of, uh, of, of discrimination. Uh, and it's sort of uh, very uh, concerning to see, for instance, that such an algorithm in Colombia has kept, uh, kept the secret exactly because you need to assess whether that form of discrimination is, uh, is happening. Um, what we often hear, hear is the problem of human interaction being reduced in the context of digitalization, and that has a lot to do with austerity, as we just sa uh, said, um, is a major reason why you have digitalization in the first place. You want to get rid of caseworkers, for instance, because it's cheaper to let an automated system uh, uh, run a social protection program. But people often need that human assistance for a variety of reasons, and so there are a lot of dignity aspects um, uh, in involved here. Um, and also, what, what we often hear is that you need civil society to implement a system well, and without human caseworkers and human civil society uh, organizations involved, you don't get that and you miss out on sort of people who are not on the radar of governments. And then finally, uh, I think uh, there's a whole debate about resources. Like these digital systems can be incredibly expensive. And so the money that is spent on innovation uh, it's not necessarily worthwhile, but it does cost a lot of money, and that money doesn't go to the people who need it. Uh, and we might think, okay, that's that's negligible, but I think in many cases that's a significant part of the budget, uh, what we spend on on system innovation, on consultancies, etc. So just to close on, because you asked, Mariana, about sort of the role of international organizations, I mean, as I just said, they are key in the sense of being important donors of uh, to countries, um, funders. But in addition to that, increasingly, I think international organizations are sort of the hubs of expertise. And so what they think, what is, what is in their policy documents on cash transfers and digitalization, an area that they're increasingly moving, increasingly moving into, uh, is highly important. But the problem then is because of that sort of technocratic nature of the debate on uh, digitalization of social protection measures, hardly anyone is involved in, um, in, in debates on those 
policies that are happening within the World Bank and other organizations. Civil society is not involved in that. It's not their fault per se, because there aren't that many consultations about those policy documents uh, uh, to begin with. And that's highly problematic because we are all working on examples of how human rights uh, and, and, and social justice is affected uh, by such developments. And then it's highly problematic if we cannot influence, if we do not have the platforms to influence those international organizations. And I think, I think that should be sort of partly our new frontier. How can we push uh, big international organizations and other relevant parties in uh, a better direction from the perspective of human rights? Thanks. Thanks, Christian, for your presentation. Uh, before I make a few comments, I'd like to encourage the audience to present questions. We still have 13 minutes to go, so we still have some time. Of course, this, con this conversation continues. It develops. I think this is a first encounter between many people doing uh, with results to show and um, incipient discussions uh, to have, uh, still to, to develop. Um, but one thing that came to my mind uh, after hearing you all is that very frequently in digital rights fora, when we think of digitization or datafication of social policies, we think immediately uh, of the age of data protection policies, right? Um, and indeed, data protection frameworks uh, they can have an enormous impact uh, on the issues that we're talking about. And many of the countries of the region of Latin America, they don't have data protection frameworks and some of, some of them they're being developed. Um, but I'd like us to discuss a bit um, whether, how far these data protection frameworks uh, can go in this discussion because I hear many different things, right? Jamila mentioned the digital divide, for example, um, as uh, an issue in this discussion that's not touched upon by data protection uh, frameworks. Uh, Christian was mentioning how those debates are not technical. They're tied to larger discussions, for example, universality versus focalization. And one thing that seems like a challenge to me is that this discussion requires different backgrounds um, and fields of discussion, right? And I think Christian was also mentioning that when he was saying that uh, sometimes the spaces are not there, right, for these discussions. Um, so which partnerships would be needed for us, for us to move forward in this discussion, or which framework works would be useful? Uh, do you know where there's, that's being developed? Uh, what could be helpful uh, in bringing those perspectives together? Because uh, it feels like it's impossible to discuss um, datafication, data rights, privacy rights of these most vulnerable communities in uh, the realm of this discussion without uh, bringing those other perspectives to the table. So I don't know if any Jamila is saying she has something to. Yes, well, maybe not. Uh, I, I would just like to to comment and to acknowledge the the the, the large way that we have came through already. I guess I'm, I'm particularly very happy to see several organizations that are dedicated to this uh, intersection. Some years ago, even to talk about data protection was something that was relatively new and uh, not that well understood in Latin America, for instance, in several of our countries. Of the countries that I mentioned, just uh, so everybody's in the same page. Well, Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil, and Bolivia do not have a data protection, uh, national data protection normative in place. And I guess that is a fundamental step. Although, as you were saying, it's not, it's not enough. I guess uh, what we are trying to develop here in, and I see in our interactions is a broader human rights perspective that includes both uh, a view on 
uh, social and economic rights and their impacts and how they are being impacted by these digitization and datafication uh, policies at uh, the public sector. But at the same time, how, uh, and, and it helps a lot when we are in uh, our context, so when talking about privacy as uh, a, a right in itself was something that was usually something hard to 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 do, right? And it's not uh, it's not just about being a right by itself. It's about being also fundamental for the exercise of other rights, fundamental for not being discriminated, as we are talking in this context, right? So. I guess at the same time, we have this layer of social and economic rights, which are completely and directly related to data protection and privacy protection. We also, we still keep the concerns on, and that's very unfortunate uh, of the, the regional context right now. We, we still keep, and, and these concerns are higher and higher every time or every day. Um, on individual rights and potential for uh, violation of the right to freedom of expression, the right to assembly, the right to, to political rights, for instance, because we are talking about a situation in which uh, data is being gathered, it's being processed, and it's being and it's generating results in a very, very opaque way for, for the public eye, right? So we have like two two situations that that continue for for being such an unequal country right we have like uh, it's very contradictory that we we have a narrative of implementing the most innovative technologies at the same time that during the pandemic what we are seeing that we still face high levels of digital uh, inequalities of in, of inequalities in general, not only affecting rural areas, uh, ethnic minorities, but also at the u urban areas. So I guess we've been a long way to, to get here and have like a good uh, perspective of everything that is involved. And I guess we have a lot to, to advance in terms of uh, talking about transparency policies, talking about social justice, as we were talking before, and a broader framework, framework for our human rights. Um. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing is that uh, one idea is trying to work better on this uh, rights-based approach because one part of the, the issue is also that uh, people uh, that participate in these programs are seen as people in need and therefore their rights are not that clear what, what is the role they should play. So uh, when you think about the, the rights of people as a community that they have to decide because you could you could see this like as two different things. One uh, one is trying to think as people as a mass from which you have to gather data in order to assess the programs and who is eligible, and the other one is to see as people as uh, participants and citizens with rights, so they can raise their hands, so they have a process by which they can um, decide how this data should be collected, what are the uh, acceptable uses of this data, and all. But the principal problem I see to, in, to go in that direction is that people are still seen as people in need. So anything that the government gives is like a, a favor to them, it's something extra. Uh, so they shouldn't be even complaining. And I think that reflects, for example, on our data protection law, because when we see, uh, when we see the exceptions uh, for, the, for the law and the way it applies, gover the government agencies are exempted at the, uh, for the most part uh, to provide reasons as to why they need the data and to comply fully with the data. I mean, it's just it's just this difference between the idea of when the government asks for data, you have to give it because it's no, there's no other way. And when it's uh, ingrained in the law and when it's required by law to give, the, give data, all the uh, discussions about consent, they are just uh, ignored or neglected. So I think, I think part of that is to work on seeing people uh, that be that they are part of these uh, benefits as citizens, as communities that can participate in the process. But yeah, this this idea of the needy one and also the liar one that is the contrary to that is the, the contrary to the good citizen that applies for the government and is transparent in terms of data is is what I think is a big obstacle to that. Thanks. Well, I think Christian wants to add something. Is that it? Yeah, just to sort of respond on what just uh, was said by Joan and, uh, and Jamila, um, I think it's not just a matter of the government not seeing certain um, citizens as real uh, citizens, but also that 
sort of in relation to social rights and exclusion and discrimination, the sort of issues that are underlying there are highly politically sensitive. And, uh, and so many governments, I think, deliberately don't open up for consultations because they don't want to hear <laughs> what's wrong with the approaches that they've taken in social uh, protection to begin with. And international organizations are certainly not going to push them uh, very hard on, on any of that. The, um, no, I'm not sure if it's an irony, but what you see with data protection especially is and I think a lot of governments see that as sort of a depoliticized area, like almost a technical area. And so they're more than happy to just copy paste uh, uh, parts of the GDPR and include that in national legislation uh, because A, it's not seen as very contentious and, um, and B, in, I think in some cases, uh, they see it as a good thing that the data that they're holding on, uh, on citizens is protected from others instead of the rights of citizens being protected in the context of social protection systems. And, um, and so, and, and then, then on top of that, I think there's a lot more international advocacy in the global rights, uh, digital rights sphere on privacy and data protection. Um, and, and therefore sort of that's high on the minds of international um, uh, organizations uh, where exclusionary concerns and human rights are just lower on their, uh, on their agenda because there's le less advocacy uh, there. Thanks, Christian. And um, unfortunately, we only have three minutes and now a few very, very interesting questions came up. We're sharing the links for those of you who asked, but there are two uh, questions about the role of, the first one about the role of private corporations in the provision of technical systems and tools for social protection. Uh, and the second one was about uh, other governments. I don't know if you'll have the question, the, the time to, to answer that. I'll just give the floor for one minute to Laura. I don't know if Natalie wants to add something quick after that, then we close, okay? I hope we can continue this conversation later. Uh, thanks, Mariana. So on the role of private corporations, the provision of technical systems or welfare systems, um, we've definitely seen that. And a quick example that we can give from PI's experience in the UK is that the government contracted out to Sodexo for benefits cards called Aspen cards, which are given to asylum seekers as they're waiting to hear back on a decision on their asylum application. And yes, it is true that these private corporations might import systems which are more than questionable from a data protection or human rights perspective. But the reality is that the government is in full capacity of actually restraining the degree to which these practices or systems are data intensive or data intrusive by way of introducing amendments or human rights safeguards to the procurement process. And I think that's something where more scrutiny is needed, forcing the governments to abide by rigorous recruitment or tender processes where they explicitly commit to human rights standards and privacy safeguards and closing all avenues for governments to contract behind closed doors with companies that we know have a worrisome record in terms of privacy and human rights. That's what I wanted to highlight very briefly. That's great. Natalie, do you have final remarks? 30 seconds, I promise. Oh, I'd just like to agree and add to what Juan Diego and Jamila said. I guess it was very interesting to do a case study and to see how that data injustice is just another layer and how deeply connected, how it mirrors and deepens other forms of injustice. So uh, we have been using this data just framework and it was very interesting to realize that uh, human rights are indivisible and interdependent and, and we can see it as the program flows as it works and how it impacts people's lives so that's this thank you for my seconds Mari. <laughs> i am really sorry that we don't have uh, more time i think this discussion could evolve over another hour because it's so interesting and rich i really think all of our panelists. I also thank the audience uh, for the attention, for the very interesting questions. Um, and I think the links probably provide a better overview of the work that everybody here is doing. Our contacts are also available on the RightsCon um, website. Um, and that's it for now, but as a beginning, 
of a conversation. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. This was a really good conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you, everybody.